In this video we will going to summarize. A tale of two cities. Let's get started. The year is 1775, and social ills plague both France and England. Jerry Cruncher, an odd job man who works for Telson's bank, stops the Dover mail coach with an urgent message for Jarvis Laurie. The message instructs Laurie to wait at Dover for a young woman, and Laurie responds with the cryptic words, recalled to life. At Dover, Laurie is met by Lucy Minette, a young orphan whose father, a once-eminent doctor whom she supposed dead, has been discovered in France. Laurie escorts Lucy to Paris, where they meet Defarge, a former servant of Dr. Minette, who has kept Minette safe in a garret. Driven mad by 18 years in the Bastille, Minette spends all of his time making shoes, a hobby he learned while in prison. Laurie assures Lucy that her love and devotion can recall her father to life, and indeed they do. The year is now 1780. Charles Darnay stands accused of treason against the English crown. A bombastic lawyer named Striver pleads Darnay's case, but it is not until his drunk. Good-for-nothing colleague, Sidney Carton, assists him that the court acquits Darnay. Carton clinches his argument by pointing out that he himself bears an uncanny resemblance to the defendant, which undermines the prosecution's case for unmistakably identifying Darnay as the spy the authorities spotted. Lucy and Dr. Minette watch the court proceedings, and that night, Carton escorts Darnay to a tavern and asks how it feels to receive the sympathy of a woman like Lucy. Carton despises and resents Darnay because he reminds him of all that he himself has given up and might have been. In France, the cruel Marquis Evermond runs down a plebeian child with his carriage. Manifesting an attitude typical of the aristocracy in regard to the poor at that time. The Marquis shows no regret, but instead curses the peasantry and hurries home to his chateau, where he awaits the arrival of his nephew, Darnay, from England. Arriving later that night, Darnay curses his uncle and the French aristocracy for its abominable treatment of the people. He renounces his identity as an Evermond and announces his intention to return to England. That night, the Marquis is murdered, the murderer has left a note signed with the nickname adopted by French revolutionaries, Jacques. A year passes, and Darnay asks Minette for permission to marry Lucy. He says that, if Lucy accepts, he will reveal his true identity to Minette. Carton, meanwhile, also pledges his love to Lucy, admitting that, though his life is worthless, she has helped him dream of a better, more valuable existence. On the streets of London, Jerry Cruncher gets swept up in the funeral procession for a spy named Roger Cly. Later that night, he demonstrates his talents as a resurrection man, sneaking into the cemetery to steal and sell Cly's body. In Paris, meanwhile, another English spy known as John Barsad drops into Defarge's wine shop. Barsad hopes to turn up evidence concerning the mounting revolution, which is still in its covert stages. Madame Defarge sits in the shop knitting a secret registry of those whom the revolution seeks to execute. Back in London, Darnay, on the morning of his wedding, keeps his promise to Minette. He reveals his true identity and, that night, Minette relapses into his old prison habit of making shoes. After nine days, Minette regains his presence of mind, and soon joins the newlyweds on their honeymoon. Upon Darnay's return, Carton pays him a visit and asks for his friendship. Darnay assures Carton that he is always welcome in their home. The year is now 1789. The peasants in Paris storm the Bastille and the French Revolution begins. The revolutionaries murder aristocrats in the streets, and Gabel, a man charged with the maintenance of the Evermond estate, is imprisoned. Three years later, he writes to Darnay, asking to be rescued. Despite the threat of great danger to his person, Darnay departs immediately for France. As soon as Darnay arrives in Paris, the French revolutionaries arrest him as an emigrant. Lucy and Minette make their way to Paris in hopes of saving him. Darnay remains in prison for a year and three months before receiving a trial. In order to help free him, Minette uses his considerable influence with the revolutionaries, who sympathize with him for having served time in the Bastille. Darnay receives an acquittal, but that same night he is arrested again. The charges, this time, come from Defarge and his vengeful wife. Carton arrives in Paris with a plan to rescue Darnay and obtains the help of John Barsad, who turns out to be Solomon Pross, the long-lost brother of Miss Pross, Lucy's loyal servant. At Darnay's trial, 
Defarge produces a letter that he discovered in Manette's old jail cell in the Bastille. The letter explains the cause of Manette's imprisonment. Years ago, the brothers Evremont, Darnay's father and uncle, enlisted Manette's medical assistance. They asked him to tend to a woman, whom one of the brothers had raped, and her brother, whom the same brother had stabbed fatally. Fearing that Manette might report their misdeeds, the Evremonts had him arrested. Upon hearing this story, the jury condemns Darnay for the crimes of his ancestors and sentences him to die within 24 hours. That night, at the Defarge's wine shop, Carton overhears Madame Defarge plotting to have Lucy and her daughter, also Darnay's daughter, executed as well. Madame Defarge, it turns out, is the surviving sibling of the man and woman killed by the Evremonts. Carton arranges for the Minette's immediate departure from France. He then visits Darnay in prison, tricks him into changing clothes with him, and, after dictating a letter of explanation, drugs his friend unconscious. Barsad carries Darnay, now disguised as Carton, to an awaiting coach, while Carton, disguised as Darnay, awaits execution. As Darnay, Lucy, their child, and Dr. Minette speed away from Paris, Madame Defarge arrives at Lucy's apartment, hoping to arrest her. There she finds the supremely protective Miss Pross. A scuffle ensues, and Madame Defarge dies by the bullet of her own gun. Sidney Carton meets his death at the guillotine, and the narrator confidently asserts that Carton dies with the knowledge that he has finally imbued his life with meaning.